last question before we get into our players here uh, to just kind of paint or this round out this this overview of fantasy football. Uh, if you were going to create a formula that kind of measures fantasy success, whether it's talent, whether it's usage, surrounding, ta- you know, there's all these different factors, right, that go into it. Like, what would you say are kind of those most important overall factors? And is there anything that's kind of irrelevant and noise in your opinion? I think it's usage is the one you got to follow all the time. And you know what? That's going to cause you to miss on guys like A.J. Brown last year, maybe Stefan Diggs. I mean, look, sometimes great players can overcome pedestrian usage, but that's the thing because it's not even about what we necessarily think about a player's talent. It's what the coaches and what the teams think about that player's talent. They're the one putting them on the field. They're the one yeah. drawing up plays. They're the ones choosing to throw them the ball. So that's why I think, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of smart people on NFL Draft Twitter, but we just – as a community, these people and, you know, all of us, you know, I'm sure both of us are guilty of it too, but we get attached to these prospects because we're, we're watching from February to April. We rank someone as our RB5, and then they go to just an awful situation where we probably have them as an RB12 if we just base it on post-draft, but because we already set this precedent that doesn't have too much to do with their NFL projection, you know, we're off base. So really comes down to volume, you know, again, chase opportunity, not talent, because even the best in the world, like the GMs, best talent scouts in the world bill belichick like when's the last time he had a good draft i know, I know he's your guy but like the, the fact that <laughs> even, even the best can't evaluate talent at a high level like don't try to be that guy pretty much absolutely uh, usage is the, the the lifeblood the the engine of everything the one debate i often find myself getting into is the the value of like coaching and scheme and you just kind of hinted at oj howard is a prime example like Arians has never used tight ends, and it seemed to be, you know, a correlation trap. It seemed like, oh, he's never had a tight end quite like O.J. Howard, but potentially that is schematic. I feel like it's it's a kind of polarizing area where some people like coaching scheme doesn't matter, don't pay any attention to it. I, I personally disagree. Do you put any stock in a coaching scheme yourself? It's just a question I like to ask all the, the people I have on here. Absolutely, because I think the yeah. scheme a lot of times – takes you to the projected opportunity. I mean, I was looking at Adam Thielen a lot this week, and, you know, Gary Kubiak, who's now taking over full-time Minnesota, okay, last year Diggs led the team with, I think it was 94 targets, and we're just looking at Minnesota's this run-first offense. Okay, Thielen's the only wide receiver one, but they're so run-first. Man, I went back and looked at Kubiak since the 90s. He's been Mm -hmm. with, like, the Broncos, Texans, Broncos again. His wide receiver one has averaged 138 targets per season. So if you only look back at 2019, you're going to say, okay, well, Dalvin Cook, but no one else. You know, this is still a Kubiak coach offense. He's just because last season he didn't have an amazing wide receiver. Well, you know, 19 of the previous 23 seasons, he was pretty close. So I like to, you know, take my uh, size with that. Because if we can get a talented player with more opportunity and he's somehow undervalued, I mean, that's, you know, check, check, check. Absolutely, yeah. I remember those years—the Rod Smith, the, the Andre Johnsons. He had <laughs> he had some monsters. I, I'm with you. I think the we'll get to pass catchers in another episode, but I'm all about him. I, I think he's so 